Welcome to Chapter 1 of Data Sense. This chapter provides a brief overview of some of the goals of this course and introduces some important terms and concepts. The first thing I should mention is that data analysis can be considered a form of storytelling, which is a fundamental human motivation and activity, both at a personal level and at a social level. This might become clearer if we think about what is meant by data analysis and how it compares to a couple of related fields. The first field is mathematics. In data analysis, this refers to the actual formulas that go into our calculations, such as the formula for a standardized score or the formula for a correlation coefficient. However, these calculations are only the most basic aspect of data analysis. Above that is statistics, which is a broader category. In this context, statistics as a field is the source of procedures like sampling, the statistical distributions used in inferential statistics, and the logical hypothesis testing and estimation. The most general field, however, is data analysis, which draws on both mathematics and statistics, but adds other things as well. These can then include an assessment of the validity and meaning of the data, procedures like data visualization, which is graphical and not mathematical, and perhaps most important, the intelligent interpretation and application of the results of analysis. In this way, data analysis really is closer to the meaning-making of storytelling than it is to pure mathematics. That's a theme I hope to return to frequently in this course. Given that there is a connection between data analysis and storytelling, it can also be helpful to remember some of the principles of good storytelling. The first is that there is always more than one way to tell a story. Sometimes, the difference is a matter of flavor, as in different productions of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet or Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. Sometimes the difference is more substantial, as in stories like Wicked that recast a villain as a hero or vice versa. But in every case, for a story to be believable or persuasive, a few things need to be true. First, the story needs to be understandable. The connection between events needs to make sense or people get confused and frustrated. That's one reason why the deus ex machina, literally God from the machine, that showed up in some ancient Greek dramas was so dissatisfying. Just as the conflict in the play reached a peak, a character representing one of the Greek gods would drop out of the sky and miraculously fix everything. It may have ended the conflict, but it just didn't connect to anything and it didn't answer any questions about the story. In data analysis, a similar principle applies. Your conclusions have to follow logically from your data and your procedures. You can't gather data, analyze the data, then ignore the data and make whatever conclusion you wanted. It's intellectually dishonest, and like the deus ex machina, it's deeply dissatisfying. Next, a story needs to be informative or useful in some way. That is, it has to tell you something that you didn't know before, or it has to tell it and apply it in a way that you hadn't considered before. In data analysis, your goal is to provide some kind of insight. Your analysis has to have a point. Finally, any story needs to be true to the data. In a mystery, for example, the detective needs to be able to explain all of the events and why they happened the way they did. When it all comes together, it can be a revelation. But if the detective leaves out important pieces of information or ignores them because they don't fit the proposed solution, then it seems dishonest and incomplete. The same thing applies in data analysis. You need to be able to explain as well as you can as much of the data as possible. It doesn't work to ignore data that contradicts your theory or undermines your goal. Instead, the story that you tell has to honor the data that you have. So if data analysis is a form of storytelling, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, as a general rule, the numbers are not able to speak for themselves. They form a part of the story, not the entirety. The research methods and sampling issues are important parts of the story, as are any relevant cultural or historical events and many other things. But the data are important because they're a relatively fixed point that cannot be easily bent to serve other means. A good question to ask whenever a person makes an empirical claim is, what makes you say that? That is, what information was used and how was it processed in reaching that conclusion? It's a way of answering the question, how do you know what you know? and it's good statistical practice. The point of this question is that the credibility or believability of a claim should always rely on process and not merely the agreeability of the conclusion. By the way, this question actually comes from arts education. 
because it's a great way to get people to think about the object that they are evaluating and explaining their reaction to it. But the question is important, so let's say it again. What makes you say that? Each story is shaped by the information or data that it needs to address and by the theory of the storyteller, among many other things. The theory is important because it's how the storyteller makes things stick together. When a person's working with data to tell a story, the person's theory can influence what data is gathered and how the data are analyzed and how the results are put together. The goal, above all, is to make the story interpretable or understandable. One interesting place where this can show up is in the choice of level of analysis. For example, in an analysis of economic data, it'd make an important difference if the analysts were approaching the data with theories from microeconomics or from macroeconomics. In the case of microeconomics, the analyst would pay a lot more attention to the decisions of individual people or companies and how they work to make a profit, with a focus on things like supply and demand. On the other hand, if the analysts use theories from macroeconomics, they would pay a lot more attention to things like national unemployment or inflation levels, economic policies on importing and exporting, and so on. The data used in these two examples might be completely different, even though the analyst might be trying to understand the behaviors of large groups of people. The theory is what makes the difference here. Another way to think about data analysis is as a form of translation where the data constitute the original text that's in a language or idiom that most people can't understand, and the analysis is the translation that makes its message or feeling clear to the intended audience. It's nice to think of analysis as translation because everybody understands that a text can be interpreted in more than one way and still have integrity. For example, the Christian Bible was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. In fact, it was written in ancient versions of each of these languages. The text was eventually translated into Latin and then other languages such as English. A quick internet search told me that there are over 450 translations of the Bible currently available in English alone, and that the Bible has more translations available than any other book. And as a side note, Pinocchio and the Little Prince have apparently each been translated into more than 200 languages, making them 7th and ninth on the list I saw. One particularly interesting problem for translation is poetry. Because as the American poet Robert Frost claimed, poetry is what gets lost in the translation. That is, it may be possible to change the words into another language, but the feeling gets lost. Then again, others such as the contemporary American poet Ellen Welker, without specifically refuting Frost, claim that a proper translation of a poem is more like a new poem, as shown in the title of her recent article, Only Poems Can Translate Poems, on the Impossibility and Necessity of Translation. What this means for data analysis is that we as analysts face a similar kind of impossible task. The analysis of the data is not the same as the data itself. Something is lost in the process. But what is gained is much more important in this case, interpretability and understanding. And that brings us to another point. The English statistician George Box had this to say about statistical models or analyses. All statistical models are wrong, but some are useful. That is, an analysis is a simplification, and simplification by its essence is not the same as the thing that is being simplified. That is, it's wrong. But that doesn't mean that the analysis is fatally flawed. Rather, it's the way that it needs to be. We just can't handle or don't want to handle all of the available information. And so, while both analyses and stories should not be careless or intentionally misleading, and so, while both analyses and stories should not be careless or intentionally misleading, it is, I think, better to see how useful a particular analysis is rather than how accurate it is in the strictest sense.